we people in my field have studied soft matter, things that are soft for years, and biology is soft. All biological systems are soft. Your body is soft. Everything that's living is soft. And so we can take the, the basic fundamental understanding of the physics that we've learned over the years and apply it directly to understand biological systems, to understand uh, living things. Um, it's because it's the, it's the right scale, it's the right, um, the, it's the right match of, of the physics that we study. That's, that's how we can use physics to understand biology. But then we can say, well, look, these really fascinating living systems, how can we understand them? They're themselves interesting, and we can use our knowledge to understand the way they behave. And it's this symbiotic relationship, this, this combination of they present, the biology presents a lot of really interesting questions that we can apply, uh, that we can understand through the physics, and the physics ourselves provides the tools that we need to understand them. Soft matter is looking at complicated, uh, complex uh, systems. Uh, we're not afraid to look at complex systems. And there are many cases where biology is itself a complex system. Can we take something that nature has learned to do really well and can we mimic that with materials to, be, to bring new properties to materials? So, for example, um, um, a big theme uh, among many people is understanding the behavior of, of uh, shells, of, of structured materials that are tough, but they don't break easily. And so somehow when you break them, they're able to withstand the cracking. And it's understanding the, the, the way that cracks propagate and stop propagating that nature has really figured out very well. And we can mimic that in trying to make, uh, nat or trying to make um, 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 structured materials, artificial materials, that have the same kind of properties. Or other colleagues of mine have understood that um, many times, you know, if you take a leaf and you put a drop of water, it just runs off. Why is that? And understanding why that happens in nature, we can mimic that. We can make the same kind of materials uh, from artificial things and have very clean windows because water just runs off them, things like that. Well, to me, I mean, look, you and I are sitting here right now after this terrible, really terrible pandemic, a terrible pandemic. Why are we sitting here? We're sitting here because of the success, really, in the end, the success of the vaccines. And they were developed really, really fast. And the key, there are two keys. In fact, you, you, you said it yourself because of the uh, prizes that you gave out. One was for the mRNA, how to make that work. The other was for the delivery, how to deliver it. And the delivery is something that we've studied, the basic physics of that we've studied for years. So we understood that uh, we were not as perceptive as the uh, people like uh, Bob Langer, the people you gave the prize to, they understood really the importance of uh, delivery for the mRNA. But now we recognize, the rest of us recognize its importance. And we see so many opportunities now for delivering other drugs, for delivering other parts of the body, for other types of delivery. So the whole world has changed, but biotechnology and the technology back onto material science, soft material science, has just exploded in the last two years because of that. And so I'm very excited by the kinds of delivery problems that we're going to do, the kinds of drugs that we can do, the, 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 the relationship between structures inside the body that we can now address using these same types of drugs. It's, um, it's a very, to me, a very exciting time.
Well, I'd, I'd like to highlight not the things that we have done, but the things that we're going to do, the things that we're working on. That's, to me, the really exciting things. And um, I, we're working on, say, two different, or three different areas. One is um, the mRNA drugs taught us that things that start out as DNA or RNA can become drugs. They can either be the mRNA itself or we can make enzymes, we can make other materials out of RNA. And what we're learning how to do is to explore all of the space, all of the possible molecules that you can make starting from RNA or starting from DNA actually. What can we make that could be useful for drugs? And we're learning ways of creating million, million of millions, not, not a million, but a million million or more different molecules that we can quickly make and screen and ask, can we find something new as a drug? Or can we find something new that's useful for, uh, for drug delivery? And we're learning how to do that in ways that we never thought were possible. And uh, then at the same time, we're trying to say, well, if we can make them, can we figure out new ways of creating these packages that are similar to the packages that deliver the mRNA for the vaccine that made it so successful? Can we make the same kind of packaging, but now not just for vaccines, but for other kinds of diseases, uh, for other kinds of treatments? And to me, it's a, it's a whole new um, uh, sort of a wealth of possibilities for delivery and a wealth of prob possibilities for new kinds of drugs, taking advantage more or less of the same thing, and that is being able to explore really large numbers and really by, by, by having this sort of explosion of our, our exploration, of our ability to explore them. This is, it's not that we're doing something qualitatively new, it's known science, we're just being able to uh, go from doing a thousand to doing a thousand, 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 thousand. Uh, absolutely. We, I, I would say we work on it, but only we help with it. I, I think that there, this is not going to be something that just us or any one uh, scientists is going to do themselves. It's going to be many contributions. And so our particular interests are how to build the superstructure in which the cells can grow and retain the structure of the organ. Uh, it's not just enough to have the cells themselves. You need to have some kind of network, some kind of gel that the cells can grow in. And I think that's where we're, our expertise is, is structuring that. And once we have that, and once we know how to do that, we can grow small organs, or we can grow parts of organs that can be assembled together by uh, uh, printing, 3D printing, or we can grow uh, structures that will en encourage cells to become more like the particular tissue that you're trying to grow. So our, I, I see our role, our expertise is trying to structure things, trying to build the structures, because that's something we're very, we're, we're very knowledgeable about. Eventually, yes, I, I see perhaps um, um, an intermediate step of some small organ being um, a drug, a therapeutic, something that you might use to treat a disease or that you might implant to um, uh, restructure an organ, not necessarily putting a new heart in, but maybe fixing parts of a heart or fixing uh, disrupted tissue or something like that. I see, I see that as coming first. Um, I see learning more about um, repairing tissue, repairing uh, problems with the heart or, or with any other organ. I see that coming before actually printing a whole new organ. Um, well, okay, so I would say that um, we, the, the, the work that we do sort of has impact on two areas. 
One is, um, you know, right now, part of the, if I would say the um, ecological problems, not just energy, but part of energy is going to be, is there enough water? Is there enough storage space for if we, if we produce, you know, we are not going to stop producing CO2. So are we going to try and store CO2? So the flow of the water, how do we get water from the ground to, to use for either, for maybe for just uh, geothermal or for drinking water? We're very interested in how we can um, extract or inject fluids into the ground in a safe, um, ecologically um, uh, viable way, uh, but still recognizing that you're trying to get a fluid in or out of something that's very, it's, it's, the, it's, it's the earth, it's, it's, it, there's not a lot of space. So can we make more space? Can we, can we break open some space in a very um, environment, environmentally sound way to put CO2 in? to put water in or to get water out or to have water flow through the heat of the ground and then take it up for geothermal. That's a very, very simple way. In, in um, uh, Iceland, everything's heated that way because they have, the, uh, they, they have near the surface, they have hot, hot, uh, hot uh, water. But in general, if we go deep enough in the ground, we could just heat things by geothermal. Uh, just by passing water through and bringing it out. So how do we get the water to flow in and out? How can we improve that? That's one question. And the same, the same basic problems are uh, understanding something about how modern batteries, which are going to be the most important, um, the, most, uh, the most challenging component of renewable energy right now is not to make the energy, but it's to store the energy because the energy is only made when the sun is shining or when the wind is blowing. And that we need energy all the time, so we need to store it. Mm -hmm. And understanding how to store it is going to be uh, many uh, issues that uh, the kind of science that we do can really address. So, um, I have two reasons for doing it. Um, and it came from starting with the, the Spanish chef with Ferran Adria, Jose Andres, the Roca brothers. Um, Ferran came to Harvard and he wanted to talk about science. He's a chef, but he talked about science. And he did this because he was interested. He thought that chefs should understand something about the science to improve the way they can make these super creative uh, types of foods that he makes. And I think that we can teach them a lot, not necessarily the details of the science, but enough to understand something about how to improve what they're making. So I think we can teach the chef something, but we have to keep, the science has to be very fundamental, has to be very straightforward, has to, cannot be complicated. But my real goal as an educator, that's what I, you know, I, own, I do research, but I also educate students. My real goal is to inspire students who don't want to study physics to learn something about real physics but to fool them because they're learning about cooking they think they're learning about cooking but really they're learning science um, and so i have the, always this uh, simple story uh, this wonderful story of uh, a student we had early on in this class that we teach uh, we teach science we teach we we take cooking and we teach them how to do science with it. Uh, and we teach them equations. We teach them how to solve equations. So we had a student who was a history major. She didn't understand equations. She never used equations. She was a history major. But we taught her how to use equations, how to understand equations, how not to be afraid of equations. And so she went away for Thanksgiving, for a big American holiday. She came back, she said, you know, I went home and my mother she made lasagna and she came to me. I made lasagna, but I made twice as much as the recipe calls for. And now I don't know how long to cook it for. And her daughter says, I can calculate how long to cook it because we taught her the diffusion equation. We taught her how to do the calculation. You had to cook it four times as long. She knew that. And she wasn't afraid to do a calculation. 
What more could I ask? Somebody who's not a scientist now understands equations and not afraid to use equations. That's what I want to do. And I do that by teaching them about cooking.